Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow's Medical Heritage Series. If you haven't joined us before, each year the Heritage team at the College pulls together a programme of events focused on all things medical history. And we are delighted to welcome you virtually to our penultimate, penultimate <laughs> event of our spring summer programme um, entitled Hands of Iron, A History of Midwifery in Glasgow. Um, today is a very special day for those of you that don't know. It is International Day of the Midwife, um, which was set up in 1992. This year's theme is 100 years of progress, celebrating the centenary of the International Confederation of Midwives and 120 years since the Midwives um, Act of England and Wales. Our college has a very unique relationship to midwifery and our collections hold extensive collections relating to childbirth, including obstetrics and gynaecology. So it felt appropriate to mark this important occasion. I'm delighted to be joined by Charlotte Reed and our very special guest discussant, Dr. Mark Skippen, to discuss the relationship between Scotland and the development of midwifery. And we'll hear from both of them very, very soon. But to kick off, um, I'm going to begin with a brief sketch of the development of midwifery throughout history and draw your attention to some of the important and at times surprising role of Scotland and its medical practitioners in advancing the profession. Before I do that, though, I would like to issue a content warning for depictions of reproductive anatomy, which will be shown throughout these talk the talk. These images will be used in context, but if it is something that you would not wish to see, um, I will be flagging it up in advance when it's coming up. Furthermore, as part of our commitment to equality, diversity and inclusion, the Heritage team would like to acknowledge the ethical issues surrounding consent, which have been raised in connection to anatomical texts relating to the female body, in particular Hunter's gravid uterus. Although central to the history of midwifery, hence the reason it's being discussed in this talk, the manner through which these specimens were obtained were not always ethical, and we want the use of such uh, texts to be appropriately contextualised. Um, to recount the history of midwifery, I feel it is important to firstly define midwifery as a profession itself. Today, midwives, as described by Lindsay Reid, a retired midwife and a medical historian, refers to midwives as a group of, quote, and autonomous medical practitioners who attend women during a normal birthing episode. They also provide extensive antenatal care and postnatal care. The regulation and practice of midwifery was formally enshrined in law in 1915 in Scotland, some 13 years after England and Wales, through the Midwifery Act. If we travel back to the 18th century, however, the term midwife refers to a heterogeneous group of regular and irregular practitioners, which was almost exclusively comprised of women. Midwives in Scotland could be called with women, howdies, as shown in the slide next to you, wise women, howdy midwives, madams, skillies, or even knee women. The midwife was a staple in the local community. She coached and supported women through birth and even at times prescribed uh, treatments for all of her patients. Like medicine more generally that during this time, there was no regulation in the practice of midwives. And so anyone could enter the profession regardless of their experience, education or skill. Yet as medicine became more professionalized, midwifery became one of the only branches of the so-called healing arts where women were accepted as practitioners. Elite medical bodies such as the Royal Colleges of Surgeons and Physicians in Edinburgh and our very own Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, which I'll refer to as the college from now on, provided the bulk of medicine's self-regulation and examination until the 1858 Medical Act. And although the college refused to admit women as medical professionals in the 19th century, they were more than willing to license them to practice midwifery from as early as the 1740s. In fact, the college were the first medical body to attempt to regulate midwifery in Britain, requiring anyone practicing midwifery in the west of Scotland to sit an examination to receive a license. Um, and you can see that in the next slide. One month after passing this act, in December of 1740, the college licensed Helen Baxter, Elizabeth Boyd, Mary Dunning and Jean Scott, quote, 
to the full and free practice of midwifery within all and every part of the faculty's bounds, unquote. This represents one of the earliest forms of legitimising women's role within medicine and highlights the acceptance of female medical practitioners in the practice of midwifery. However, from the 1730s, a number of outstanding developments would transform the practice of midwifery and carve it into a series of distinctive specialties, which we would now consider to be midwifery, obstetrics and laterally gynaecology. But we're going to focus on those first two for the duration of this talk. As I just mentioned, midwifery was considered to be an exclusively um, female practice um, by, and it was accepted by the medical elite in Scotland, as well as the rest of Britain up to around the mid 18th century. Yet it would be false to say that men were not involved in childbirth. In reality, surgeons in particular played a crucial role in attending challenging births, which required surgical interventions. Sadly, at the early stages, often these instances required the surgeon to attend following the, a death in childbirth, and often he would be dealing with a, he would not be dealing with a living patient. Thus, medical men's role in childbirth practice was considered peripheral, deferring to the midwife until crisis deemed it necessary for him to intervene. Yet, as we can see in the following slide. From the mid 18th century, the term man midwife increasingly became adopted to refer to medical men who attended both natural and stressful births. The rise of the man midwife, because a man could not just be a midwife on his own, emerged in tandem with medical men's increased interest in women reproductive and maternal health. This change can be attributed to a number of factors, including but not limited to an explosion of knowledge um, surrounding the anatomy of reproduction during the 1700s and the development of obstetric uh, practices, techniques and instruments. And I'm going to take you through some of them now, as well as their connection to Glasgow and the rest of Scotland. So during this period, several treatises and lectures were developed and published on the theory and practice of midwifery across Britain, which helped to medicalise the practice and legitimise it as a specialty worthy of medical men and their attention. And in the next slide, you'll see that much of the discovery surrounding obstetrics in Britain at this time can be attributed to one local man, William Smiley, nicknamed the father of modern British obstetrics. Smiley was a member of our college in the 18th century and was born and raised in Lanark before obtaining his medical education in Glasgow and London. Dissatisfied by the quality of instruction concerning midwifery, he wrote several treatises and developed several techniques and instruments, including the forceps, the curved crochet and the double crochet. Um, Smiley taught over 900 students in the course of 10 years, none of which, interestingly, were women practitioners, and he trained them all in the practice of midwifery. Um, he pioneered his teaching via the obstetric machine or phantom, um, which we can see in the next slide, a device of his own design that was, quote, contrived to resemble and represent real women and children on which all kinds of different labours are demonstrated and even performed by every individual student. And although several of these machines, like the one I'm showing you now, emerged during this time across Europe, Smiley definitely didn't invent this machine, um, his was really distinctive and was often considered to be more lifelike and, and machine operated. Um, although sadly, none of his exist to this day and they largely remain a mystery. Um, now, to let you know, this next slide does show depictions of Hunter's gravid uterus. So just to give you a content warning for that just now, um, if we can move on to the next slide, however, um, we can see that Scotland or more uh, Glasgow or more accurately Scotland's connection to the rise and diversification of midwifery does not end with Smiley. Because um, among his pupils was one William Hunter of Hunterian Museum fame, whose anatomical representations of the gravid uterus was instrumental in understanding the anatomy of pregnancy and in illuminating the mechanics of childbirth although the way in which he procured patients for his dissections remains contested and ethical issues do surround um, his development of this field. Moreover, as our guest speaker Mark Skiffin has discussed, during the 1780s, two Scottish surgeons, John Aitken and James Jeffrey, who was actually a former president of the college, developed and implemented the chainsaw for use in difficult births. Now, don't worry, it's not the ones we imagine now. Um, it was much different to, to that then, and I'm sure you can ask Mark about that in the subsequent Q&A. 
Um, in particular, this chainsaw was used in cases of pelvic disproportion, which was very common at the time due to the prevalence of rickets in Glasgow. His thesis also acknowledged the role of Margaret Cameron, who performed the first successful caesarean section in Glasgow, improving the procedure and contributing to its growing popularity within the city. By the early 19th century, instruction in midwifery was mandatory for anyone wishing to obtain a medical licence in Scotland, some 80 years earlier than England and Wales. And then, if we fast forward a century, we can also see the influence of Joseph Lister, a fellow of our college, whose antiseptic and aseptic principles, according to Irvin Loudon, was, quote, the most important development that had ever occurred in obstetric practice. So these developments in education, knowledge exchange, techniques, instruments and practices contributed to the medicalisation of childbirth and the rise of obstetrics. Yet it also provides as an avenue for physicians to specialise in an area of medicine previously dominated by surgeons and take an increased role in women's reproductive and maternal health, a sphere that was previously considered to be women's business. Though at the time considered midwifery, all these texts and all these developments were considered midwifery, soon the lines between the two professions would become increasingly untangled and distinct, and male midwifery evolved into what we would now consider to be obstetrics. However, alongside these transformative and revolutionary developments in the practice of childbirth, we can also see the growing erasure of women in the practice of midwifery, as, and that's kind of a general trend um, with medicine more broadly during this time. Because midwives were not medically trained in the sense that they were excluded from medical schools, they were increasingly considered irregular and ignorant practitioners by medical men who sought to reduce, regulate and replicate their practice. As, many, as medical men took greater interest in midwifery, so too they contributed to growing anxieties surrounding the skill and knowledge of the original i.e. female midwives. Indeed, the college's rationale for licensing midwives in the 1740s was in part the result of having considered the many dismal effects of the ignorance of midwives, quote unquote. Now, it's important to note that this was a very accurate and fair assessment of the practice of midwifery during this time. It was indeed unregulated, and so the quality and practice varied greatly. However, this was also the case in medicine and surgery. And although the college licensed exclusively women in the first decades of their midwifery examination, it is nevertheless clear that gender contributed to the attacks on traditional midwives during this time and their licensing of women declined sharply throughout the 18th century. Um, eventually, women would actually be formally excluded from their licenses. The rise of man midwifery thus also occur occurred alongside attempts to professionalise medicine, curate professional boundaries and create a, personal, a professional identity for the medical profession, which was inherently male. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, we can actually see the role of gender and negative attitudes towards female midwives very clearly in the texts and treatises written by male midwives. Several treatises written by British doctors during this time condemn the female midwife while simultaneously justifying their increasing medical control of childbirth, further demonstrating their professional aspirations. For example, in Smiley's text written in 1790, he begins by giving a comprehensive history of midwifery, stating that, quote, in the first ages, the practice of this art was altogether in the hands of women. Women would have recourse to none but persons of their own sex and diseases peculiar to it. And this shows the aversion of medical men in dealing with women's bodies at this time. But he then states that midwifery knowledge had been, quote, buried under rubbish of ignorance and superstition because the assistance of men was seldom solicited, suggesting that men's exclusion delayed the development of the profession. Later, Smiley also argued that, quote, due to the weakness of her sex, unquote, the midwife, quote, can hardly be supposed mistress of medicine. In his text then, Smiley simultaneously denounces the work of women and prides himself on the accomplishments of medical men in rescuing the profession, for lack of a better word. But Smiley is not unique in his views, however, um, and I, we can see this in the following slide. Um, as lecture notes obtained by from Dr. Dr. James Young Simpson, um, an eminent professor of midwifery in Edinburgh between 1960 and 19, uh, nope, in 1760 and 1769, further notes that, quote, the science of midwifery is but very modern and what chiefly delayed the progress of it is it being confined to the hands of women. 
It's surprising that they were allowed to blunder on so long as they have done among all nations. As attitudes towards female practitioners continued to sour, women were also increasingly excluded from courses in midwifery. And we can see this again in Glasgow via lectures provided by James Muir, a surgeon and member of our college. Although women were allowed to attend, it was restricted, with Muir stating in his advertisement that, quote, no woman will be admitted to these lectures unless her character for sobriety and prudence is attested by some person of reputation. The same um, reputation uh, kind of, I guess, statement was not uh, necessary for men. This demonstrates the way in which medical men began to carve women out of the specialty of midwifery during this time and create a medical hierarchy that was predominantly male despite the historic role of women in attending childbirth. Consequently, women's erasure from midwifery played a significant role in women's eventual exclusion from medicine as a whole during the Victorian period. Women were excluded from the 1858 Medical Act, and it would not be until 1876 that they would regain their right to practice medicine through the Medical Amendment or Enabling Act. Um, the college itself wouldn't um, admit women again as licentiates until 1886. Um, and it actually didn't um, admit its first female fellow until 1912. Interestingly, we, from this point, we see women return to their historic profession, with female medical practitioners increasingly focusing on specialties relating to women's health, um, such as obstetrics and gynaecology, which my colleague is about to discuss in a moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that for then. Um, so to conclude with uh, the final slides, um, the question still remains, did man midwifery improve experiences of childbirth? Well, it's undeniable that the developments in obstetrics from the mid 18th century had a revolutionary effect on patient outcomes. From a time when infant and maternal mortality was exceptionally high, these developments reduced death and childbirth considerably throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. With greater, greater access to medical education, male midwives could recognise and treat unexpected con applications during birth with greater efficacy and apply a host of instruments, medicines and techniques to protect both mother and child. Yet some historians and even um, some cont contemporary commentators, which included medical men themselves, it, it wasn't just women, argued that the assistance was too invasive and the increased use of obstetric instruments in particular added to the dangers of pregnancy during this time. And as our discussant Mark Skippen notes, um, the development of obstetrics is far more than a battle of the sexes, but rather a fight for professional control, autonomy and agency across several competing actors. But it's also true that the gender balance in midwifery has also reversed back to its original equilibrium. In 2018, 99.7% of UK midwives were women, representing perhaps a full circle moment in the profession of midwifery. These are themes which we will no doubt discuss during our Q&A, yet what cannot be debated is the overwhelming significance of Scotland's contribution to the medicalisation of childbirth and the history of midwifery and obstetrics. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and you can end slides there, Christy. Thank you. OK, great. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to our introduction. Um, with that, I am, as I mentioned in the talk, we um, are about to move on to our next um, speaker and I'm delighted to pass on um, to my colleague Charlotte Reid. Um, Charlotte is a postgraduate researcher from the University of Strathclyde and she is currently completing her MSc in Health History. We have been really lucky to have her over these past few months as a research intern looking into our obstetric collections. Um, and as I said in the talk, Charlotte, I, I don't want to preempt you um, whatsoever. Uh, so feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. And likewise, Kirsty, if you can share slides whenever you can, that would be great too. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Charlotte Reid. And as Kirsten was saying, um, I'm currently studying my master's um, in health history at the University of Strathclyde. And the college here in Glasgow, they've been very accommodating and they've graciously they've allowed me to carry out my research here at the college um, as part of my work placement. So before I briefly discuss my research findings, I'd first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to the heritage team 
for including me as part of this event. Um, so a big thank you to Claire, Kirsten, Kirsty and Ross for including me in all this. Um, they've allowed me to use the library and their collections um, and there's a lot in their collections that I could have rummaged through all day, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, so for my research, um, I've been looking into the Glasgow Women's, um, the Glasgow Obstetrical and Gyne Gynecological Society. Um, and I've been looking at how the society gradually accepted more female professionals. And as Kristen was saying, this was a medical field that women were more accepted by male members um, across a great period of time, I should say. So I'm pleased to say that there is a rise in female membership throughout the society. So moving on to my next slide, Kirsty, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was looking at the period between 1893 and 1911, and I found out that well, I was happily, happy to find out that 17 women joined the society and they started appearing in the monthly meetings, which um, I found very informative because you can see throughout my research um, that I was looking into, um, they become more vocal um, in their research findings. So in my following slide, if that's okay, Kirsty, um, this is all the names that I've managed to draw out from my research um, of the women that join the society. As you can see, there's quite a lot. Um, but the one that stood out to me was Jane Boys, and she was very important to the society because she was the only one that I could find that passed her triple qualification um, here at the college. So with my research, I was asked to examine the minutes book um, here at the college and I found it to be very informative. Um, on, on the next slide you can see some pictures that I took of the, the minute book. So um, yes, yeah, so I was basically observing how the women became more involved and they started attending the meetings. Um, as you can see that the minute book it was very descriptive with the detail um, and there's a lot of handwriting, different handwriting, so some of it was quite hard to analyse but I managed to pick out the important bits. So one of the most prominent figures that kept popping up throughout the minute books was Alice McLaren and Elizabeth Pace. Um, and I'll discuss about them in my next slide. So as you can see in the top right corner here, um, we've got a picture of a building. Um, so this was the Glasgow Women's Private Hospital around about 1900. And here, Alice McLaren, she served as the superintendent um, there at the hospital, which I found to be pretty cool. Um, and one thing that I didn't know about Alice McLaren was that she was the first female practitioner and gynaecologist in Glasgow. Um, so I, I, didn't, I didn't know that until I was actually doing my research, but I wish I knew that sooner. And she was also friends with Elizabeth Pace, who was also in the society. Um, I think that they actually shared a house together and they were quite active within the women's suffrage movement, um, which I thought would be very beneficial towards the meetings actually, because I think it sort of encouraged them to voice their medical findings that they found um, whilst working. So although there's plenty of women that I can talk about um, that were in the society, I think one of the most prominent members um, was Dame Louise McElroy. She's in my next slide. So the thing is, Louise McElroy, she kept popping up in my research and I found out that she was reporting secretary to the society. And I found this, I just found this awesome because um, she was just, she attended, I think she basically attended every single meeting. Um, and sometimes she was the only female um, that was there. Um, sometimes it was Elizabeth Pace, but um, most, most um, the, the woman that most like popped up was Louise McElroy. Um, and she just gave so much um, research contribution to the society. And there's lots and lots of information in these minute books um, with Louise McElroy's findings as well. That's the end of my slides. 
thank you so much for uh, giving us such a nice overview into the work you've been doing um, with the college and um, in particular the, the um, minute book of the Glasgow Obstetrics and Gynaecology Society. Uh, the only thing I knew about it was that we had them. <laughs> yes. so it's really interesting to see that um, you see that increase um, in, in kind of women towards the end of the 19th century and, and the start of the 20th. That's Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, just a reminder again, if anybody would like to ask any questions um, or add any comments into the chat, please feel free to do so. Um, we are now going to move into the discussion portion of the Q&A. And for that reason, I would like to formally um, introduce and welcome our very special guest discussant, who you've already heard his name uh, multiple times, uh, Dr. Mark Skippen. Um, he has no doubt been waiting very patiently to contribute to our conversation, and we're delighted to have you. Um, Mark is the Associate Director of Marketing and Market Insight at Swansea University and a historian of medicine because the, clearly those two jobs, you know, you can't get enough. <laughs> um, and as I discuss in uh, my talk, he's perhaps most famous for his discovery of the invention of the chainsaw and its connection to childbirth. Um, and I'm sure that sent some shivers down the spine of some of our attendees. But as I mentioned in the talk, um, it's, it's not exactly what, what we think. Um, his research into Scottish obstetrics, particularly in cases of pelvic disproportion, has been invaluable for recounting this history today. So I'm really delighted to have you with us, Mark, um, to discuss um, midwifery and then to have your expertise. Um, before we start, um, would you like to maybe just say a few words about our, your background, um, um, your interest in the topic, and then maybe some things just to, some themes to perhaps get us started? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Christine. Can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you great. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yeah, as, as Christine said, I um, it's been a little while since I was in, involved in this field. I'm, I'm now responsible for admissions at Swansea University. Um, but this is an area that is very close to my heart because I, I spent about eight years um, just immersed in it, a lot of that time in the Royal College. Um, so I initially I did my um, anatomy degree at the University of Glasgow. Um, during my anatomy degree, I did a, a research dis dissertation on Professor James Jeffrey, uh, which is where the, the chainsaw connection comes in. Um, that was published in the Scottish Medical Journal a couple of years later, um, and it's still going now strong, people finding interest in that, which is which is fabulous. Um, after that, I went on and did uh, a master's in history and then a PhD in the history of medicine at, at Glasgow um, under um, Anne Crowther and uh, Malcolm Nicholson, who some of you um, in the audience will, will know. Um, and I actually spent quite a bit of time um, referring to, to Alison Nuttall's um, dissertation during mine. So really pleased to see that Alison's here as well. Um, because I'm sure you'll you'll be able to contribute to this discussion in, in probably a, a far better way than I can. Um, beyond that, I when I did my, my PhD, my PhD was on um, obstetric practice and cephalopelvic disproportion um, in Glasgow between 1840 and 1900. So a very specific period of time, partly because it was a period of time um, which very few people people had actually looked at and I think a lot of the work that had gone on had been around that time prior to, to that during the 18th century and then um, post that during the, the 20th century where there have been significant changes in, in midwifery and then and then in obstetrics as well um, and I think a lot of the work that had, had looked at that period between 1840 and 1900 has suggested that that was a period of, of little change or very slow slow change across the, the profession which actually, when we when I looked at, at that, and, and Alison um, has also looked at that period in Edinburgh, there are significant things that did happen during that period, which have made a, a, a big impact on what's happened since then, um, which we can talk about more a bit more during the discussion. I think the things I was particularly taken by when you were talking, Christine and um, and Charlotte, were two things. Um, one, obviously, that there's the um, gender and the medicalisation of childbirth. That, as you say. It's, it's not as clear cut as, as men versus women, um, which it can sound like as you, you move across it. But there's a whole range of different factors that were, were playing the part in that. And I think there's a, a really good point that you made at the beginning, which was the quote from from Smiley, where he talks about the science of, of midwifery. Um, that's really interesting because he talked about science there to try and differentiate male midwives from the female midwives at that point. Um, they carried on having to or using that and trying to make that point that they were based in science for, for more than a century. Um, and it wasn't so much that they were trying to differentiate themselves from female midwives as we got later on into the, the late 19th century, but it was rather against um, other, other medical professions. 
um, during the 19th century. Um, in most cases, um, the the male midwives or obstetricians, as they they then became, um, often would have to defer to the the knowledge of surgeons um, and general practitioners rather than being able to take responsibility for themselves. So they were constantly striving to try and demonstrate that they knew what they were doing um, and over what those other um, other professionals were doing within the same um, within within medicine. The the, the, the element that, that came out, which is particularly relevant to, to Glasgow and to Edinburgh and then, and then to the rest of the world, um, lastly, was the work around that Lister um, did in Glasgow that had a significant impact on how obstetricians were, were perceived within the, um, the environment. And part of the work that I did was looking at, as Christine mentioned very briefly, the work of Murdoch Cameron around caesarean section. So um, when Lister um, put forward his approach for, for antisepsis back in um, 1867, when that was first published. Um, that obviously made a massive change across the medical world and surgery in particular um, as the decades went by. However, initially it was quite slow progress. It wasn't that instantly everyone um, jumped up and, and listened and um, changed their practices. But what you saw, and this is a piece of work that Anne Crowther did um, several years ago, was those people who were training under Lister um, they really, they really took on board what he said, and they almost went out and um, sort of spread the word themselves, but practiced those things themselves very quickly. Um, so what you saw was significant changes in Glasgow quite early, um, within sort of the decade of when Lister's publication came out, and then um, latterly in, in Edinburgh, and then it almost spread further from that direction. Um, and with Murdoch Cameron in particular, he there have been a number of cases of cesarean section that were carried out in Glasgow during the 19th century, which which weren't successful. The the, the mothers died. Um, in most cases, the um, the children didn't survive either. Um, but Murdoch Cameron um, in 1888 performed what was the first cesare successful cesarean in section in Glasgow, only two weeks after the first ever cesare successful cesarean section in Edinburgh. Um, so. Those two things happened sort of, um, almost in, in sync. Um, Cameron then performed another cesarean section a couple of um, months later, which was also successful. Eventually, he did, he did nine cesarean sections in a row, which were all successful. And that in itself was enough for a lot of British practitioners across the UK um, to change the way in which they were approaching cesarean and seeing it as an important part of their, their toolkit, which it hadn't been before. However, that was only possible because of the work of Lister. Um, so there, there's significant challenges there for the, the profession in terms of what was available to them. And um, the, the the thing that, that came across really, I think, was just massively important, which has, hasn't really been talked about very much, but I picked up in my thesis slightly, and Christine, you mentioned there, is I think one of the, the driving forces between, between behind Glasgow being so different to a lot of the rest of the of Britain in particular and possibly other parts of the world in the way that the profession changed both from where it was originally when when you were talking Christine through to, to where it is now is education um so that point you made around the college license for midwifery in 1740 you know that, that was very very early um we had the situation for um for medical practitioners where as you're saying, in Glasgow um, and in Edinburgh, um, very early on in the, the 19th century, they were required to have done a midwifery course as part of their medical degree in, in order to, to graduate. Um, you know, in Glasgow, that was a, a six-month course as part of their, their degree programme. Um, that was you know, 50, 60 years before the rest of the, the UK had to do that. Um, we know that during that period, people saw Glasgow and Edinburgh and the rural colleges that were there were sort of the gold standard of medical education in the UK. Um, we had people from all over Britain coming to, to study. Um, thank you, Ross. Um, to, to study in um, in the um, in Glasgow and Edinburgh for that very reason. So the fact that midwifery was a fundamental part of the educational um, curriculum during that period undoubtedly would have made a, a sea change the way in which those practitioners that came out of those programs um, perceived it. And I, the, the final point I'll say before we move on to the discussion is I think um, we focus very much on the 18th and 19th centuries here, um, but Glasgow has also played a fundamental role in developments that have happened um, since then. Um, one that's particularly close to me, partly because my um, Malcolm Nicholson, who was my PhD supervisor, works on it, was the, the work around 
um, diagnostic obstetric ultrasound, um, which Ian Donald and some engineers, um, Tom and the other name um, escapes me, um, but developed in, in Glasgow. Um, and that obviously had a significant impact on on this field of, of work. Um, and yeah, that, that was predominantly came about around Donald's experiences in the war, um, where he saw sonar and radar being used, um, and also his religious views and, and other elements that made him think actually this is something that we need to do. So I'm going to pass back to, to Christine. There's, there's plenty of other things I could say, but I, I don't I want to give other people an opportunity to actually ask questions and, and contribute. Uh, no, uh, do you know, thank goodness that you um, preempted me to speak because I could have just listened to you continue on until the end of the webinar because there, there is so much that you can point to that connects, you know, midwifery to the development of medicine more generally, development, that, uh, uh, that um, competitiveness which emerges from time to time between physicians and surgeons and GPs and chemists and druggists and apothecaries and you know everybody just kind of trying to carve out those professional boundaries and distinctions and um, yeah they're really there's so much that we could discuss so I, if I can please invite um, Charlotte back um, on screen um, if anybody would like to ask a question please raise your hand you can also use the chat function as well um yeah if, if there's any questions please please feel free to let us know um see where where charlotte's gone make sure you're able to join us hello <laughs> okay great um so I think what I'll do is, is whilst everyone's mulling mulling things over, and, and again, feel free to raise your hand at any point, enter questions in the chat, whatever kind of suits you best. Um, I think maybe a nice general question to kick us off, and you kind of preempted it yourself, Mark, is um, you have this period um, when just kind of all of a sudden midwifery and obstetrics, you know, becomes this kind of moment um, in medicine. And I alluded to a couple of the kind of key changes and, and kind of discoveries, I guess, which happened in obstetrics. But I wondered if, Mark, you could maybe speak a little bit more about, you know, that time period you were discussing and, and kind of what really brings men into the fold when it comes to obstetrics and um, midwifery more generally. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few points that um, I'm aware of. I think that, I mean, <laughs> It sounds crude to a certain extent, but part of the reason why um, male midwives in particular, those who were originally general practitioners, um, decided to move into this field was, you know, some of them would have been um, general interest, but also being at the, the birth of a, a child and also working with a, the mother gave you an, a route in to effectively being a me medical practitioner with that family for the rest of their, their lives. Um, so it, it was a, a business opportunity for for many of them um and the you know depend, depending on how successful that was um that would have made a difference the other thing i think was which was really important during this period um so in glasgow during the um during the well from 1792 onwards for up, up until sort of the mid 1800s uh, there are four um, lying in hospitals maternity hospitals that were established um, now, those hospitals were were fundamental in, in various ways and very different to, to how we perceive hospitals now. Um, the vast majority of the um, practitioners that worked in those hospitals, um, they attended births at home. Uh, very few of them actually happened within the hospitals themselves. They were established as almost a, a hub for those practitioners to come together and consult within, um, and very few um, came forward. but medical effectively during this period you had a whole range of medical practitioners which were competing with each other for for patients in various um realms almost um and they were constantly trying to try and find ways in which they could demonstrate their 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 understanding their knowledge and their experience but also that they um were in a position where um patients should come to to them rather than to to other practitioners that are there and i, I think the 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 key thing with the the, the lying in hospitals in Glasgow in particular was um, yeah, they they remained as hospitals where most people were being seen in their homes. Um, this this meant that male practitioners 
that were going into homes. Um, what you see in the case notes is constant. Um, there was there was never a straightforward case where they had a, a process that they followed. Mm -hmm. um, every single individual um, case was different because the factors that are influencing the decisions that they made were always different. In some cases, the, the, when they went into to a home, um, the families were particularly influential. Um, you know, the women themselves um, had a, a say in what happened in those situations. Their families had a say in what happened in those situations, which wasn't the case in, in hospitals to the same degree. Um, they also found themselves in a situation where the actual circumstances were very different. You know, some of the, the places that they were going into in Glasgow, particularly in the um, sort of mid to um, early 19th century, very small cramped conditions. They weren't conducive to the medical practices that they were being taught within their, their degrees or practicing in the, the hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, so they found themselves in quite a, a difficult place. It, it wasn't it wasn't an easy thing to, to be doing. However, I think that the, the most one thing that's really fundamental to, to recognize as part of all of this is although there is that shift from um, female midwives to, to male midwives, which happens very much towards the end of the, the 19th century in a, in a big way, the vast majority of, um, of births were attended by female midwives throughout yeah. all of this period. <laughs> um, and what I'm talking about is was a very, very small proportion of, of cases. And it was really only after antisepsis came in, after um, people like Cameron did their work on cesarean section. At that point, the Glasgow Maternity Hospital then pushed for um, people to send um, or to go into to hospital. This was around sort of 1890. Um, so when you get to that point, there's a sea change where there's almost a a, a, a trust. Purple fever isn't isn't quite the same problem that it was before. Um, people see lying in hospitals as somewhere where they can go, and it becomes more medicalised. Prior to that, the majority of people that were going into lying hospitals were going in there from a social perspective. And it's like that. That Alison has written a lot more on the, than I have. It's, if, she's, if, if Alison, if you're here, we great to to have you um, involved in this part of the, the discussion. Absolutely. <laughs> um, no, thank you for that. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad you're. You're raising things that you know you you can't possibly put into 15 minutes you know that the point that um whilst in my talk i was very much focusing on that kind of legislative change there's that huge gulf between the legislation and the medical elite and then what's happening in your local community and your rural community or even your urban community so you see throughout the kind of periods that um the college whilst it's trying to assert control over like midwifery and it's trying to regulate it it's the, the people that are doing it are, are very few and far between it's it's far more common to see the college try and restrict somebody and uh, the fine was 40 40 scots um was was for practicing midwifery without a license and some of the interesting things as well is you'll see them fine a person and then the next month give them a license <laughs> so even even their own standards of what what constitutes like a quality um, midwifery education in that early 18th century period is in constant flux um but the point you've made about the kind of and again it connects to these wider histories the rise of that hospital medicine and that kind of emergence as the hospital as the site for medical intervention you know at this time you very much kind of see that start to transition and um, in terms of the lying in hospitals what would be the kind of woman that would go to a lying in hospital is this a free service is that a service that um, they have to pay for how, how do the lying in hospitals work um so the lying in hospitals in glasgow were mostly funded by subscriptions um, so this would be people who could afford to subscribe, wanted to provide charitable donations to the Glasgow Maternity Hospital or to the other hospitals. There were occasions when I was looking at the case notes where you could see that they actually had an influence on the people that were going into these hospitals because they they were prior to um, the work around um, antisepsis, actually lying in hospitals but weren't seen as somewhere where you wanted to go. Um, the death rate within or maternity mortality rate within hospitals was much higher than it was at home. Um, and that that was partly related to um, some of the cases that were going in, but really it was around um, things like spread of infection um, within those environments, which they just didn't understand at, at that point to, to the degree enough to, to stop it. Um, so one of the, the lying in hospitals actually remained as a lying in hospital, but completely closed its in its its hospital. Um, it only did um, home births. Um, so the I, th I think the, the the hospitals themselves were, um, say, funded by the subscriptions, 
the people that were going into those hospitals, the women that were going into those hospitals, um, generally um, poor, um, often they'd be going in there for weeks. Um, they were, it was seen as a place where um, they would be able to get the, the nourishment they'd need to actually get themselves stronger before um, giving birth. So they were in there, not just at the point of pregnancy, or sorry, a, a giving birth. It was actually quite a bit before that. Um, that changed as we got to the end of the, the 19th century. Um, at that point, they were asking for people to come in when it was a, a, a what they saw as a problematic birth, how that was diagnosed was, was challenging for them. And um, But there was a big shift at the end of the, the century where um, that, that I think the way Alison Knott was described it is the, the move from a sort of social to, to medicalized um, hospital um, delivery. The, 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 the fundamental thing, I guess, with the, the patients that were going into these hospitals is we have to remember that because because the treatments they had then were, although um, sound similar to what we have now, were very different. Um, they they found themselves in, a, in a, a situation where that changed how they could work within hospitals. So, for example, um, with a cesarean section, uh, one of the reasons why those people who followed Lister's practices just after he published his paper, um, they they carried out cesarean sections in those, um, and as I say before Murdoch Cameron, um, unfortunately the, the women died that those were performed on, was because the the approach prior to to that was very much they need to basically try leave labour to last as long as possible in the hope that it will be okay. Um, and if it wasn't OK, then try what you can before you get to cesarean section. So effectively, once you got to cesarean section, you had women who were, in, were exhausted going into a major surgical operation with rudimentary um, techniques and, and practices. It wasn't a surprise that those women didn't survive those operations. When you got to Murdoch Cameron, that first case that he did was someone who they had it was almost ele it was elective surgery, almost they had pre prepared ready for cesarean section. Um, they, uh, the woman would have been in hospital for a, a week beforehand. Um, they given her food, sleep, rest. Um, they prepared the room. Um, it was a strange experience. So ethanol that was in the room set fire and there's flames that went up all the way up to the ceiling is how he described it. Um, so it was memorable for, for more reasons than, than one. Um, but the, the situation that they put the woman in, I guess, in, in that situation, very different to the circumstances previously. Now, it's not to say that um, women who had the means to pay didn't go into hospital, but what you found is they didn't go into lying in hospitals. Um, so there were cases of difficult um, births that were um, looked after within some of the private hospitals within Glasgow, where it's likely those women will have paid for those services. Um, they wouldn't have wanted to go into the the lying in hospitals, which were were seen as something which didn't work for them from a, a you know, from a, a, a social perspective as well as from a, a health perspective. Yeah, no, that's so. Again, thank you so much. It's it really does resonate, and it, it, it again kind of goes back to even even uh, Smiley. I'm sure he cites that he gave uh, he attended one thousand one hundred and fifty births. I think. And all of them were were done kind of free or gratis. So there's definitely like a, a you know a class element to this kind of development of midwifery, but also in kind of improving these outcomes and uh, kind of developing the field as more and more people you know see birth as a which what it is is it's a terrifying, ev constantly evolving um, medical procedure. You know it, it's always changing, it's always evolving. So no, it's it's a, it's a really interesting thing to see that that kind of shift from home and, and hospital. Um, Charlotte, you you have been looking at our um, Glasgow Obstetrics and Gynaecology Society minutes, uh, which is a great mouthful, and I'm so glad I got it out in a winner. <laughs> can, so you you spoke about some of the like amazing women that you kind of found. Can you tell us a little bit about like maybe how they uh, contributed to the society, or maybe some of the kind of interesting cases that you maybe found that they discussed during that time? Yes. Yeah, so um, the one that kept popping up most and um, I would say Alice McLaren um, she was the most vocal one um, and she I think she demonstrated quite a lot of her research findings to the society um, one thing that I noticed about um, her when she was delivering her demonstrations um, she got quite a lot of questioning about it 
um, to make sure if it was accurate or not. And she um, she more or less said, yeah, it is, it is accurate. Um, but yeah, there's there's quite a lot of detailed um, like descriptions of what they showed um, to the society, which I found to be quite interesting. They showed like cysts and tumours and things like that. And they actually brought out the specimens of them mm -hmm. um, so everyone could have a look at. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it was quite it was quite interesting to see them you know, gradually get more involved within mm -hmm. that medical field as well. Um, so I quite, I quite liked that. It was quite interesting. Absolutely, yeah. And as we mentioned in, in the talk, you know, in the kind of introductory uh, discussion, you know, women only really got, regained that kind of right to enter medicine in, in 1878. And I, I find it so interesting because one of the reasons that women advocated often for their re-entry into medicine or and, and, and you know and that's not to say there wasn't other <laughs> um women involved at the time there was but one of the things they do talk about again is this you know women should be out on hand to attend women's health issues which is the same argument in the 1740s which then goes away and then comes back again and I find that so fascinating um but you also mentioned that um you know the women were very much involved in the kind of suffrage movement and they were you know very politically minded do you do you see that in the case studies or do you kind of see that more so just in your background biographic research? Um, I think that, I, I, I think I previously said, um, I think that because they were involved within the women's movement, I think that gave them a sort of podium to sort of, you know, discuss their viewpoints and their opinions. And I think that they showed that across the medical field as time went on. Yeah. Yeah, so I think they used that to like their own, their own advantage in a good way. Uh-huh. No, yeah. definitely. Thank you so much. Um, Christine, can I pick up on a couple of things that have been in the chat? Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. That's right. So first of all, um, Jan, um, you mentioned Jean Donaldson's book. It's a yeah, really good book. Definitely recommend um, reading that. Um, alongside that, Irvin Loudon's book, Death in Childbirth, is a um, fa fa fabulous, really well-researched book, um, which covers you know, a whole range of, of timeframes and, and, and is you know, a really good read as well. Um, I was going to pick up on Ross's point, and I'd be interested to know from you, Charlotte. Um, I, was, I was really taken um, by the name um, Louise McElroy when you mentioned that uh, for two reasons. One, when I was doing the the work on Murdoch Cameron, um, Louise came up in there. Um, she was one of the first um, female medical graduates from the University of Glasgow. Um, and from what I remember, she became a, a dame because of her work in midwifery. Um, so, you know, she really amazing woman um, and fundamental figure to, to the history of, of this field in, in Glasgow. And I'm wondering, um, I've, I've not looked at the, the, the sources that you, you're talking about. I spent days and days looking at the, the records in the, the Glasgow Maternity Hospital and then journal articles and so on, but, but didn't come across um, many of the things that you're talking about. I was wondering what, what things are in there? What are the sorts of things that we might be able to, to take away from that? Not, not necessarily the, the content itself, but what sort of things are you, um, you know, what types of resources are sitting there that we might be able to use that haven't been used already? So what I was using, I was using the minute books of the college. Um, so basically it was um, a handwritten uh, recording of all the meetings that took place um, within the college. I think the earliest it dates back, I would say about 18, the late 1880s, 1890s probably, um, it goes back to. Um, and I think um, you can see up until the, the war years, it gets less and less information, obviously because medical professionals were needed abroad and everything else. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, entries about um, what, what their findings were, um, and they were basically just discussing um, how they could improve their practices and um, the field that they were working in. Mm -hmm. And as you sadly um, begin to complete your research with us, um, as Ross mm -hmm. said as well, you're only beginning to scratch the surface with it. Is there anything that you're kind of leaving with a bit of a comma rather than a full stop that you're like, I just, I might need to come back to this at some point? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think when Claire showed me the, the research collection, I just, I seen so many things. I just wanted to grab my hands on and have her homage through, you know? Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully you can have me back and I can have a, a little look through and I can find more information out. <laughs> what are some of the things in particular that kind of drew you um, that maybe you couldn't quite look at now, but you could maybe pocket for later? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there was more minute books um, I could have had a look at. Um, 
but I was more interested in that specific time period um, because I think that that minute book in particular I was looking at, I think that that's when you truly see the transgression of the the women becoming more involved within uh, gynaecology. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you very much, Mark, as well, for flagging those points. And it, again, second, um, Irvin Lousen's text, it's, it's so, it's, it's incredible. Um, I know, again, just to, to beef up Alison Nuttall, she's um, got a, a, a article forthcoming very soon as well, which um, I'm very looking forward to as part of Janet Greenlee's um, work on maternal health. So I'm very much looking forward to that too. Um, again, just to um, let anyone else know if there's any questions or comments from the audience, please feel free to add them or raise your hand. Um, what I would like to maybe think about just as we kind of begin to wind up is, um, and you kind of actually mentioned it in your talk a little bit, Charlotte, is um, this issue of like, there seems to continue to be a bit of a stigma, I guess, and a kind of continual um, kind of lacking of acknowledgement in terms of um, gynaecology, reproduction, histories of childbirth. Um, and I wondered if I could ask, you know, both of you, like, just if, if you think that's the case, if, in if thinking in terms of, like, representing heritage, um, is reproduction an easy thing to represent in kind of museums and in libraries? And if so, why? If not, why? Because um, for me, one of the things I'm really drawn to is we have an extensive gynaecology instrument collection. And um, whenever we pull those objects out for whatever reason, it always evokes a great emotion, um, particularly amongst women or, or people um, with uteruses. And um, that discussion always kind of comes up and, you know, like, oh, like, I remember that. Or, or it, it kind of does the opposite where people recoil a little bit with it. Um, and internally, when we talk about um, these instruments, we think about, you know, the ethics of it, the um, issues of, you know, the, the, generally the stigma that continues to this day around reproductive health. So, Mark, if I could maybe perhaps come to you first, I, do you find this in your experience? Yeah, I think there's, there's a few. So first of all, I, I did an anatomy degree, um, so I sort of <laughs> well, cut, I cut my teeth in a slightly um, <laughs> morbid way in the first more place. More desensitised. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. And I, for those of you who haven't been there, um, the anatomy museum at the University of Glasgow um, is a, a fabulous resource. And in in there, they have the casts of the William Hunter gravid uterus work, um, which is yeah, quite something to to behold. But I, I think the the thing that, that is always a struggle, I think, when you're doing any research into this area. Um, and it's it's an important thing to to really consider as whenever anyone's looking at any of these things is the absence of the voices of of the female midwives, but also the the, the patients themselves. Um, when I was doing my my research, you know, I spent hours in the archives in, in London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, all over the place. And um it's it's just not there. And yeah, there you can read journal articles, you can read hospital case notes, but all of that is from the, the male practitioner's perspective. Um, and it's the same for what you you see in, in most of the places where um I mean not the Wellcome Trust and places like where they've revised their their museums and, and improved them. Actually, you know, that's slightly different, but a lot of these things that are being presented from sort of historical instrument perspective, um, are those that were kept by the men and put aside for a specific reason. Um, and I think we always have to, to think about it in that way. There, there is a good reason why these things were, were kept or put aside or put on show. Um, I, I go back to, to the Murdoch Cameron work because there's something that was really interesting, which I found. So um, when, when Murdoch Cameron did those cesarean sections, so what he published were the successful cases. So he had nine cases in a row which were, were successful in that both the, the woman and the, the, the child survived. And then there are another five cases that he published as well later on in that century. Um, now, those cases are the ones that other practitioners became aware of because they were written up in the journal articles. Um, in Derek Dow's book on Rotten Row, um, he talks about, about it as well. Um, however, going through all of the case notes for the, the hospital, I went through every single case note for, for 60 years. Um, it took me quite a while. What I found was that Cameron had actually performed several other cesarean sections in between all of those where the multi there was a, a much high, there was a, a, a number of deaths. Um, at one point, there was a period of years where he had about 50% maternal mortality. Those were never published anywhere. Um, so we always have to think about why these things are on show in the first place, what they were trying to portray at that point, because that obviously influences how we, we perceive them ourselves. 
Absolutely. No, I think that's a, a, a very valid point. And um, actually, our, our next event is locating the patient in medical <laughs> heritage archives. And, and, and I promise that I didn't pay Mark to, to set us up for that one. Um, although, like, if you if you want a coffee, let me know. But um, you're absolutely so spot on um, that, that what we have are things that have been curated already before they enter the archive. And definitely and in, in my limited experience I definitely haven't looked at any as any extensively as you have but there is a, a complete erasure of women's agency and 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 that and from a patient perspective locating that is is um very very difficult um I'd also I'd, I'd add to that I think um we have to be really careful about how we present medical history as well um I think you you made the point um earlier on around the the hunter work and um i think the, the questions about how they source the, the material for the work that, that william hunts did now, that's really interesting because there's, there's a, a proper debate about that now um mm -hmm. in the i think there was a, an article that came out and, and suggested that um there are nefarious circumstances around the way in which they um got those women um, however, then there's been several um, pieces of research since then demonstrating that there were probably that that wasn't the case. Um, they weren't murdering women necessarily to 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 to, to do that work. Yes. Um, and I think the work that I did with the chainsaw is a really good example of that as well. Um, so I did this several years ago, but um, James Jeffrey and John Aitken in, in Edinburgh, who was an obstetrician in Edinburgh, um, they came up both saying separately, although it was in the same couple of years, so it seems unlikely, with this idea of a surgical chainsaw. Um, John Aitken suggested it for symphysiotomy, which was used in cases where um, there was severe pelvic disproportion um, for, for childbirth, um, while James Jeffrey was suggesting it for um, for a, a completely different purpose, um, not related to obstetrics, but in the, the field of, of war and um, helping to excise um, parts of joints um, for, for people that had crushed limbs, um, which bizarrely, um, the, a, a new, the, the modern version of that change that was, was shown today at the SECC at the Emergency Medical um, Research Conference <laughs> where all the Prada medics were, uh, talking about the same thing, but 200 years ago, wow. still using almost exactly the same instrument that James Jeffrey um, developed in 17, 1790. Um, but that, I think that what, what happened with that was really interesting because I, I wrote that paper with Stuart McDonald several years ago, um, just thinking it was an interesting piece of piece of work. Um, but more recently, um, someone went on TikTok and asked people to look up why was the chainsaw invented and to video their face um what what they looked like while they were finding out the answer now what comes up when you search on google is the chainsaw was invented for childbirth which is sort of true um and not entirely but but sort of true what that led to is millions and millions of videos on tiktok um and it went onto the newspaper it was in um qi with um stephen fry and sunny toxic talking about it and, and so on a whole range of things that came out of it but it's, it's twisted the history um, yeah, it's, it's talking about the the scariness of this um, instrument. Um, yeah, how awful it is. It was the precursor to the modern say modern lumber ch chainsaw that now exists. Um, you know, so it had a a long standing history, not just in surgery but in in other areas. But what that has done, and if you read any, if you go on any article at the moment, because they, they don't refer back to the original research, but they refer to this TikTok video, um, it's twisted what the history of that that instrument was for. And actually, it was it wasn't really used in symphysiotomy. It was suggested by John Aitken. Um, it was written down in a book, but symphysiotomy was very rarely used within the within British um, obstetrics. It was something that did happen um, slightly more in Europe, um, but that tool itself um wasn't that wasn't actually something that was particularly used in childbirth mm -hmm. um so again i think we have to, we've, we've got a responsibility as as people looking at the history of these artifacts as to how we we get that information out there um, which is part of part of the reason why i want to say that here because i don't get yeah. to to do that in any other way so <laughs> well you can take the, the the man out of the history archive room but you cannot take the historian out of the man because absolutely everything will always be more nuanced and more balanced and more complicated than you you could ever imagine <laughs> but thank you for that i think it's a it's a really important thing when you know balancing that act between you know telling engaging stories 
and then glamorizing something to a, to, to the extent it becomes a falsehood. Uh, so I think that's a really wonderful and important point. Um, and, and Charlotte, again, just to kind of like uh, sort of round up here, um, going back to that question of, of representation and, you know, how, how uh, do, from your kind of own just personal experience, do you think there is a kind of like stigma around obstetrics and gynaecology? Do you think that that's something that we can challenge in heritage settings or what, what are your thoughts on everything we've just discussed? Yeah, I find it um, I find it quite disheartening when you said that people like recoil when they see the the tools that were used, the equipment that was used um, during the operations. Because, um, like Mark was saying, I think that we tend people tend to focus more on the gruesome side of it rather than how it's how gynaecology has actually been very beneficial and how we've progressed over the years. I think that you know the people tend to focus on all the bad things about it. Um, so I think that it would be good, I think, if we have more exhibits um, like this one, like this event, um, to talk more about gynaecology. Because I think from what I've, what I've heard and what I've been researching, I don't think it's a, it's a sector that's talked about as much as it should be. Absolutely. Um, and I've just got kind of Ross in the chat there. Um, so there has been a lot of thanks for some um, great uh, reading suggestions but Ross has also mentioned that it's, it's a really big consideration of how we present our medical heritage and something we discuss regularly when displaying our collections hence the reason we have that I had that question purely part of our work is, is what we call reframed um, internally and externally where we try and look at our collections in different ways and through a more intersectional lens um, and you can find out more with that on, on our website if anyone is interested in the audience but um, yeah, I think that you've raised a really good point that, you know, it's it's about like just representing history in a way that's accessible, Charlotte, and, you know, having that kind of, um, like, have that space, I guess, for challenge. But I think what you also mentioned, and in terms of the recoiling, what it really comes down to is that a lot of times people ex have experienced these instruments. So again, to summarise what Mark was also saying, perhaps what we need to do when we're approaching this in heritage is actually gain a user perspective and a patient perspective and ensure that those voices and those testimonies and their experiences are represented and it's not coming again from that medical hierarchical gaze, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, completely out, out, out of the woods there, but I think that might be a really nice way to end. <laughs> Um, thank you. If I, if I can just ask everyone to join me in thanking our wonderful um, discussants, uh, Dr. Mark Skippen, who very generously um, donned his medical history hat once again for us today, um, and Charlotte Reed, our brilliant postgraduate researcher. Um, as I mentioned, our, our next event is going to be on the 30th of May, so just before the um, Jubilee holiday. It is rescheduled, so if you do have our leaflets, it will say the 2nd of June, and then the Queen just had to give us a holiday. Um, but we have to listen to her. <laughs> um, it will be on the 30th of May, and we are absolutely delighted to say that it will actually be an in-person event, our first one in, in, in I don't even know how many years so um, please feel free to join us uh, look on our website and um, again if you would like to keep up with us and up to date with all of our goings on you can follow us at RCPSG Heritage um, again Mark and Charlotte thank you very much thank you to all of you for attending and for making this a brilliant virtual event and have a wonderful Thursday evening uh, yeah that's, that's us all done <laughs>